Hey everyone, our latest Trade to Black podcast, we sit down with a former police officer turned CEO of a California cannabis company. So what do we discuss? We talk about the Brittany Grimer issue right now, and will she be sent home knowing that she was sentenced to nine plus years in jail for a small possession of cannabis? What's even crazier? Thousands of people have the same similar case going on right now in America's own backyard. And there's some stories that will leave you shocked. What are they? Find out right now on our latest podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's Trade to Black podcast. I am your host, Shad Dales. Before we get into the details, as usual, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We would not be a channel without you. So if you like the information that we're sharing, you're going to want to see this podcast here today. We're talking about the California market how lucrative it could be, and we have a very good thought leader to break it down to understand where it's at, where it's going, and radical changes that are about to take place. So before we get into today's podcast, as usual, all views on the Trade to Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are pure the opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or guests as investment advice. The views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice. Okay, let's get to it. This week's podcast, we bring in... He is the co-founder, CEO, and chairman of Glasshouse Brands. He's back on the podcast, Kyle Kazan. Great to see you. How's the summer? Summer's going great, Shad. Thank you for having me. As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, all the people in the office, you guys, uh, you know, you guys have the best podcast in the space. Appreciate um, it. I only have a few, two or three that I that I, I yeah. really enjoy. Yours is one of them. <clears throat> I don't Did I really it. ask how summer's going for somebody who lives in California? <laughs> you, you know Not a bad uh, place. Head, head is down working on glass house brands so to me august is just another month but i will tell you uh the best job in this in los angeles is weather is a weather person because you can basically say it's going to be yeah. 78 and sunny tomorrow <laughs> just like it was today yeah that's a job that you want to have that's for sure ben the lead financial writer benjamin a smith from the dales report how are you sir Doing very well, yes. Uh, cannabis earnings season is coming to a close, most of it anyway, and uh, it's quite an interesting quarter. Looking forward to uh, talking to Kyle again. Uh, great interview last time, so uh, thanks for the kudos and shout out, uh, Kyle. Appreciate yeah, that. We, we do appreciate it. Uh, we, we can talk a little bit about your earnings reports and what you thought and some of the updates with that. I also want to talk about, and this is where I want to talk about this whole California market. We've had some interesting guests on the last couple of weeks uh, some saying that they're not, you know, multi-state operators are not walking away or completely closing the door in the California market. But right now they're going to walk away from it just because they feel like the state has got to figure their quote unquote shit out. Uh, and then there's others basically saying that we're going to see radical changes within the market. Um, it's the biggest cannabis market in the world. And right now we could see even more big changes. A lot of things come into play based on that. We had, uh, Aaron Edelheit, obviously, on a couple of weeks ago that talked a lot about uh, the accolades of what you guys are doing. So needless to say, your focal point is California. You obviously like this state. You see there's great potential. So if I'm an investor or I'm looking to get into this industry, maybe explain some of the detailed information as to where the current landscape is right now, the changes that are going to take place, and most importantly, Backing up maybe some of the points or views as to, as to why you think the state is going to be so lucrative, not necessarily long term, but short term as well. A lot to unpack there, Shad. <laughs> um, so, um, so our only focus is California. Period. Yeah. Full stop. Um, we we think. I'll just I'll use first person. I believe that um, we are the tequila. Mexico of tequila. We are the champagne, France of champagne. Um, California and cannabis have been, you know, when you think of the summer of love, 1967, people went to San Francisco, hate Ashbury, they were smoking cannabis. When people came back from Vietnam and they were wanted to drop out, a lot of them went to the Emerald Triangle to go and then they dropped out, they'd grow cannabis. Yeah. So there is a deep, deep history. And even me, when I, when I was in high school in the 80s, we all smoked pot. And it wasn't mm -hmm. a big deal. Even the cops back then didn't treat it as a big deal. And when I became a police officer went through the background, you would have no police if that was a limiting factor in your, in your becoming a, a, a cop. So it is part of our culture out here. 
And, and so because of that, um, the strain variety that comes out of California is sort of what makes it special. And you can't BS the consumers out here. You can get someone to buy something one time, but they're not coming back if, if they feel the value proposition is not there. Right. And, and I've had a number of friends go to New York. And as you, as you guys may know, there are a lot of stores that have opened illegally in Manhattan. And um, the people that have gone there that have done the reconnaissance said they're, they're carrying California brands, including ours. Now, mm. we don't sell anything illegally. So they must be getting it from someone that that uh, buys through metric out here in California. Okay. But it's not just it's just not our brands. And <clears> so the other thing is illegally, the bodegas, if you go to a bodega in New York and you say what 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 you have and most are selling some sort of cannabis, the highest price is California. So the, if the illegal market values California the best, I think that says something. So I think that that is an important aspect to to uh, to our value proposition is is uh, is where we come from. And so um, and also when you talk to investment banks in New York, they think at least half the brands will come out of the state, if not if not, the you know, the vast majority. So so we feel good about that right now. When you talk to Boris Jordan, you talk to some of the other CEOs and the MSOs, Harvest just closed two open dispensaries in the state, just boop, closed them up. Um, their, their, their thought is, we're going to take a pause on California because of where California is today. Yeah. Most of them will say, like Boris, the future really includes California. We need to have a California strategy. We look at it a little differently. We don't need an other state strategy as far as investment. Our brands will get there. Um, so our, our belief is just hit it here. It's still the largest market in the world, California. Yes. And so, but today, the pricing of wholesale cannabis in California is destructive, meaning almost nobody can make money selling wholesale cannabis because there's too much and, and there's a washout going on. It happens in every industry, especially ag, um, where in a capitalist situation where we were selling at really profitable numbers, everybody got in and brrr, the roof fell in. Mm -hmm. And so we're happy because even at these destructive pricing, we're able to make money. So that means we can survive. And if you can survive through this process, the price will come back to where you can make money. Will it go back to where it was? I, I don't see that because there was way too much margin. So I think it's going to have, it'll have a, the homeostasis will be, you're going to have to be lean, mean, and grow very good quality. And then, so I know there's upside from where we are now, but if you're, if you're an MSO and you can be in Massachusetts and you can be in Maine and you can be in Ohio yeah. and, you, and there's actually limited licenses, and there's actually not that big of a of an illicit market. Why why would you screw around out here when when your numbers mean better and you're going to be, you know, lauded by the street uh, by not having to put so much bandwidth and money out here? I have no choice. Yeah. Uh, but once <laughs> once this battle is over, and we and we head to federal legalization, whenever that is, I'm not predicting that. Um, I'm built for federal legalization. The MSOs are not. The MSOs are built for this time where you're you're vertically integrated in every single state. When when the walls come down, they're going to have to fix themselves. So I'm going through my pain now. Their pain is the future. Okay, so let me ask you about that, uh, Kyle, because that's a good point. Because in a way, I view Glasshouse as coming from you know positioning for federal legalization. So you're starting early and you're focusing on the biggest market, because if you can survive there. You'll be fine whenever federal legalization comes down the pike. But the, most of the other MSOs are are taking the more profitable approach now and going to you know be, be, oper, operators in these different states. So, what do you say to investors who perhaps look at this and say, "Yes, you know, we see your strategy. Uh, it's going to work out in the long term when federal legalization comes." But maybe that's ten years down the road. Maybe why should I look at Glasshouse right now? So we're not for every investor. And I know people, you know, the investment banks out there will cringe that I said that. Look, I'm the guy that buys the distressed house on the street. There are people like me. You know, in 2010, I was buying foreclosed apartment buildings in Atlanta. Most of the most of the large apartment groups were on the sidelines. 
So okay. I'm I'm always the what used to be called I used to, I was called a vulture investor in 2008 by Bloomberg. By the way, okay. that's a bad that's a bad word. Now I'm a value investor, <laughs> an impact investor. Um, okay. But so if 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 you want to wait until the fight is settled and then you feel better, I would imagine that should we be that company or one of the winners of California, which I would predict we will be. Um, we'll be trading at a higher number and you can say, all right, I don't mind that I didn't, you know, I, I traded risk for, you know, for that surety. You can do that. <clears throat> if you're a value investor, you might look and go, do they, will they survive this? And then if they do, will they be the winner? And then I have the, I have the most upside and I'm willing, I'm willing to take that. But I would, I would caution those. And, and I'm not trying to throw shade because I'm friends with Boris and Jason Wilde, and, 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 I, and I respect what Kim Rivers is doing. So, and I think they, all three of those, those companies are going to win. But I am going to tell you that you don't need a supply chain in every single state you have it. You are going right. to have to take some right. write-off. You are going to have to restructure your company. And that's something, so I'm taking my pain now versus waiting a few years from now um, when, when this opens up. And what, may, what gave us, you know, all of a sudden our stock jumped. And I'm like, oh, today, and I, I can't predict my report card on a daily basis. Uh, and it's a little frustrating sometimes. But the court case in Maine and what happened yesterday uh, really um, made us feel good because that's part of our thesis. And again, one, one thing I want to make, point I want to make, none of our numbers, none of our modeling includes federal legalization and interstate commerce. Yeah. Right now, we are built for California. Yeah, we don't need it to happen. If we have to go ten years, we can go ten years. And our plan is to grow and be a profitable company in California, and continue to expand. But we are really a free call option for anybody invests in us for interstate commerce. So how do you like, um, like, gorgeous facility? It's a hundred million dollar facility. Um, you talk uh, about. 93. 93 million. Okay. Got to be accurate. Right. Um, but at the same time too, these are all great ideas. Like what's the cash runway? Like, how do you start turning profit? I guess I don't want to use the word survive, but you know, you're going to go through a little bit of bumpy road. How do you get through these times in order to sustain yourself long-term, um, uh, as a business model within the state? So by the way, survive is not inappropriate. It doesn't insult me. And as an investor, when I talk to other investors, you know, any kind of arrogance right here will get your head lopped off. So okay. I tell our company, it's like, look, we got to survive before we thrive. Okay. Um, and, and every and every CEO in California, if you're not speaking like that, your head's going to get lopped. Okay. Um, you know, uh, cash is a big deal. Most companies right now are downsizing. We don't have that luxury. I will tell you, this is not my first company I've ever built. Mm -hmm. um, I'm used to building and running low margin uh, companies that we need to scale and be smart in doing it. So we don't have tons of bandwidth. Um, but as we announced on Thursday, we're raising new capital, 26.5 million, 10 of which will pay off some short-term debt and 16.5, um, will through our model will get us to profitability and our run rate, uh, on a revenue level between now and August and January will triple. So, and mm. that's with the acquisitions that we made as we're onboarding those. Um, so we don't have to do, we don't have to do one, any more acquisitions. We just have to execute to, to plan. And by mm -hmm. the way, that means also that the pricing of, of wholesale cannabis, we, we <clears> think <throat> it stays destructive. So our model is conservative. We know there's going to be bumps. Um, the risk for an investor investing in us is execution risk and that we would run out of cash. Um, we don't think that will happen, um, but that's in any of the cannabis companies out there. Those, those, are your, those are the biggest challenges that I think as an investor that you have to look at. Mm -hmm. so, so last week, uh, Kyle, uh, Glasshouse announced uh, Q2 to, uh, 2022 earnings. And yep. uh, it was a challenging quarter to say the least, probably in line with a lot of, you know, uh, multi-state operators where it was lackluster results for the most part. And um, 
obviously you're not cash flow positive right now, but you project to be uh, by early 2023. So I was hoping that uh, you could get a little bit granular and tell us how you plan to do that um, and, you know, convince the skeptics who are still like, you know, California is still a mess and we don't believe that you can actually get there. How do you get there? So the first thing I would tell the skeptics who think California is still a mess is California is still a mess. <laughs> so now that said, uh, to answer your second question, we cut our cash burn. Mm -hmm. the main part of our cash burn is we were building into basically another million two square feet of um, um, of our of our 5.5 million square foot greenhouse. We, we basically turned on million two. That cost a lot of money. And it's very painful on your profit and loss when you um, when you're spending money and you're planting plants and you've got the labor and you got everything and you're not monetizing it. It takes a little bit of time to monetize it. Um, the grow team led by Graham Farrar did an amazing job. We did. This is the third time we've turned on a greenhouse. So we have some experience. They did it faster. We went through the. Uh, the licensing as fast as possible, in fact, ahead of schedule. And so the painful part of, of that is almost through because now we're monetizing. And the thing that scared me the most was coming into, say, uh, it's almost a year that we've, we've owned this $93 million facility, which, by the way, insurance, when we bought it, so before all the inflation we've had, said replacement costs, not including the land. So put land at a zero was $250 million. Wow. So we bought it for 93. So it was a good value. So you could call it $250 million facility plus, um, or just use the number that, that we use, um, which is what we paid for it. But um, so the big thing we had was we had half a million square feet of facility. And we think we do a little bit better than everybody else. But there's great Dutch farmers out there. There, there's you know very powerful yeah. what we had, <clears throat> and we knew that 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 there was going to be commoditization. And it came, so we bet the entire company. We the whole purpose of going public was to buy that farm because we thought it was different. But what we found was we're actually getting higher pricing, to, at about thirty percent more than we're getting from our Santa Barbara facilities, and we're doing it cheaper. Hmm. That's why? the reason why we we can survive. The, the quality of the flower, because, and I'd love to have you guys out to Southern California. Uh, you come to LA, you stay in Hermosa beach at the beach house, right on the beach. And I know, I didn't even know those guys, but they, they just got a free. I'm product. on my way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it this way. Your significance That's... would love your work trip. And about an hour North um, is Camarillo. And we'll take you through this facility. And we'll even, if you go another 45 minutes, take you up to Santa Barbara, which also is lovely. Yeah. And we'll take you through the progression. But this facility is high tech. This facility generates 14 megawatts of its own power cleanly. Um, and, and I will tell you, ESG matters to us, but we are good stewards of capital for our investors. Mm. That's number one. But in California, we're environmentalists by nature just because we love this environment. So we try and right. be good to it. Right. So when you can generate 14 megawatts cleanly and you've got a great aquifer below, so we don't have water issues and we recycle all the water that we get anyway and that we use, when you see this, you're going to go, oh, my God. And so the quality of the flower, I would tell you today, and we've only gone through like one cycle in this new greenhouse, I would tell you is comparable to average indoor at a sixth or seventh of the cost. And environmentally, I, it's, not, it's not even comparable. So that was our thesis. And I will tell you, Graham and I were like, I hope we were right because we just bet everything on this. We believed yeah, to our that's, soul it would do it. That, that's and always it's, been it's, a big that's always been a big question, you know, with uh, large outdoor greenhouse grow is that, you know, size and scale seem to be the main primary uh, uh, sell line. But when you look at how the industry is evolving and the sophistication of users, like you're not going to sell, you know, uh, a, a wine connoisseur, a cheap bottle of beer. The product obviously has to be really, really good. But um, that would be fascinating, obviously, to come out and see exactly how you do it. But you're finding, based on the response, the product that you're generating in a greenhouse facility is equivalent to, say, an indoor grow. Yes. Yes. 
I, I, I would tell you that this is from the lips of wholesale buyers who buy both. They buy indoor mm -hmm. and they buy this. And we know, you know, their seasonality, the better your environment. And, and, and let me give you just some other, let me give you some other analogies. Like for instance, tomatoes. Yeah. The tomatoes that you get, you know, and I'm gonna use an American reference because I don't know if Costco is, is in Canada, but you go to it Costco is. and you get a little, a little see-through box of tomatoes. All of those are grown in greenhouses, either in, in the US or in, or in Mexico. Tomato sauce is grown outdoors mm -hmm. because it doesn't really matter what it looks like. You just mash it up and you put it in. And I think that's gonna be the same thing. If you're just doing pre-roll or mainly if you're gonna turn it into oil, you can do it outdoors. But what we're finding is that the cogs, and we announced that uh, our cogs for, for grow, and that includes our less efficient Santa Barbara. So it's weighing yeah. us a bit. We're gonna take in the third quarter to $150 a pound. And we believe in the fourth quarter, we're gonna take it to $125 a pound, which is basically unheard of for indoor quality. And so mm -hmm. we are really excited about that. Um, and we basically put a target on our, us by saying this, this is what we're gonna hit because we believe we're gonna do it. The other thing I would say is back to the other question about California is imagine Iowa and, and for decades, the, the folks that have been, the farmers growing corn They've been doing fine. It sells around. And all of a sudden, federal comes in and says, you can only sell Iowa corn to Iowans. Imagine what that would do. And this is what's happening to California. Imagine what that would do to the great state of Iowa and the best corn in the country. You would all of a sudden have just a few growers. Some of the small growers that grow amazing, you know, specialty corn will survive. And then you're going to have some of the big folks like us that can scale and can keep the cogs down that will survive. And mm. then imagine that all of a sudden the walls came down, those folks that, that could actually survive during the proving time, like we're doing right now, would be the sharpest knives in the drawer. Imagine how successful they would be when they could then get unleashed throughout the country where nobody can compete with Iowa corn farmers. Right, right. That's what I'm telling you is happening here. That's the vision. And so we look at it as a way to test and prove and. You know, we're in the war right now, and we just know we're going to be gritty and ready. Um, and, and also, how many companies in the United States, especially in, in good ag areas, have one facility that's 5.5 million square feet? So everyone else is sort of spread throughout. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you think about what the non-cannabis companies that are going to be coming into the space are going to look for, they might look for something that Glasshouse Brands has built because yeah. it fits to the companies in alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceuticals, Amazon. It's a lot easier when you've got things narrowed to very large industrial facilities. Mm -hmm. So, so Kyle, you touched on briefly uh, earlier um, about the U.S. Court of Appeals of the First Circuit in Maine, which affirmed the uh, Dormant Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which applies to federally, which applies to cannabis, essentially. Uh, obviously, right now it's federally illegal, so inter interstate commerce is not just going to magically happen tomorrow or anything like that. But uh, tell us the significance of the ruling and what it means to your company specifically. Is it just more of an aff aff affirmation of when federal uh, cannabis is legalized down the road, or is it something more? First, let me tell you that when I when people started flooding my inbox with some of the tweets out there, I have to admit, I don't often do a jig, but I did a jig. So I felt pretty good about what I saw. And, and let me tell you the basics, and I'm still getting my, I'm still getting my arms around it. But the basics were that in Maine, they put a, a restriction on, on how long you had to have lived in Maine, like two years or something like that before you could become licensed. Okay. They sued the state in federal court. Federal court said, hey, guess what? Even though cannabis is federally illegal, which we all know it is, um, they still have the protection of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Which so means what? Which means which, what? Which means that the Commerce Clause says that you in Maine cannot, cannot exclude the other 49 states. We are the United States. There is interstate commerce. You can't just 
You can't just box everybody else out. And so that is huge. So what that tells me, one, that does not mean that I'm going to load up a bunch of cannabis in my SUV and drive it to Arizona. It's not happening. It hasn't changed anything day to day. But what that does is for the MSOs and anybody that, let's say they're lobbying in D.C. for federal legalization, but they want to box California and Glasshouse out to buy themselves more time and more profits, that is unconstitutional. And so as soon as it's descheduled and as soon as it's descheduled or legalized, where all of a sudden the feds stop doing the harms that they're doing. And let me put it this way. Anybody who's sitting in Congress that can sit there with their, con- that their conscience and look in the mirror in the morning, shame on you. Shame okay. on you. You're doing the same harm that you've always done, and it's on your watch. So that's what I'm going to say. And, and by the way, I tell that to my representatives. But <clears throat> when that happens, and it's not an if, it's a when, um, we're coming. We're coming. You can't, and if we have to get a lawyer and go ahead and sue, we'll sue. But the Commerce Clause of the Constitution stands. So when this happens, that will open up interstate commerce. It's, 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 it's going to be not long after that we'll be coming. Now, will we have to pay local taxes? Will there be little gamesmanship? Sure. But let's also remember, New Jersey and I think Oregon have already voted for interstate commerce with other states today. Yeah. So, it's, it's just a matter of time. It, what it said to us, the big significance is that the federal court has acknowledged that even though this is an illegal industry, when it's legal, we, we also have constitutional rights, too. Yeah. You've been very vocal on Twitter, you know, when you talk about social justice and equity reform and you, you being a former police officer, this is kind of near and dear to your heart and you want to see change. And some of the stories you were telling us actually off camera, and I was hoping that you could maybe shed some light onto like what you're seeing. And uh, we've heard it a lot. Like, it's pretty ridiculous when you think of like, even on Joe Rogan's podcast where he's uh, outlining people that are spending 20, 25 years in jail for minimal amounts of possession of marijuana, which is asinine. If you think about it, I cannot believe that we're still talking about this here in 2022, but um, I don't know what the right question I want to ask, but most importantly, I just want to shed some light and speak to people and speak to thought leaders that obviously experience this every single day. But what are, I guess, some eye opening situations that you see and um, do you see change do you see change uh, happening, or is it just a lot of talk still? So I think a lot about this, <clears throat> and I'm I, I, to to my knowledge, I'm the only cannabis C-suite executive that was also in law enforcement, and thus was involved in the war on drugs. Okay, and I was involved in the war on drugs for five years, and I get a I, you know there's a lot of people that really get upset that the fact that I was involved in that and now am on the other side, uh, they find that offensive. Like I should have, I should be in the penalty box for the rest of my life. Did you view it differently back then as what you do now? Yes. Look, you do. People are entitled, people are entitled to their opinion. And, and look, a lot of people feel strongly about law enforcement. I am very pro law enforcement because if you don't have law enforcement, what we had in the old wild, wild west was 10 paces and shoot. And you have vigilantism and you have, you know, things like that. We can't have that. We can't have the, uh, you know, Mr. Aubrey that's jogging down the street and these vigilantes decide he doesn't belong there jogging down the street and they end up shooting him. That's mm-hmm. what happens when you don't have police. Thank goodness those guys were sentenced to, to prison. Mm-hmm. Now, my involvement you know, a good police officer back in, from 1994 to 1999, I, I was a police officer in a city in Los Angeles County. And back then, you know, you get, you get accolades for felony arrests. Low hanging fruit was possession of drugs. And then you try and chase it up to sales, things like that. <coughs> Cannabis, I will tell you, you know, I didn't bust, you know, I think there were like two, two people that I busted for cannabis in five years. And it was, they were ridiculous stories and it was in my face and I was sort of stuck. Um, it was mainly methamphetamine and things like that. 
And, okay. and the more I got in, into the war on drugs, and, and at the same time, I was building a real estate syndication company. So I'm doing business, and I'm also being a police officer, and I'm realizing we're spending enormous resources. I'm an affable human being, so I got to know these folks because they were leading me to the drug dealers. And I realized these are people with drug problems. And many of them would start asking me openly to help get them, um, you know, take them to rehab. Right. Which, by okay. the way, would be so much cheaper than jail. And I had no, and I'm sitting there going, I have this gun belt. I've got different tools. I can handcuff the person taken to jail. And it, it was like, so towards the end of my career, if my wife were telling you, she would say, I went from being vigorously involved with the war on drugs and being a good police officer to disenchanted about that and not really making any more drug arrests and just focusing on, you know, taking dangerous people with guns off the street. And that's what I did. In about 2008, I started speaking out. So about three times the time of my police career, about 15 years, I've been speaking on behalf of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, or now Law Enforcement Action Partnership, LEAP.CC. Okay. And basically, it's a bunch of uh, police uh, judges and district attorneys, U.S. attorneys that speak out. Now it's more of a broad mission, but it used to be just about the drug war. So I, I've been openly opposing the war on drugs. I would legalize and regulate all drugs. That's a longer discussion. And the answer is yes to every single drug you can name. Because if nothing else, it's the least worst option. And the war on drugs is a war on people, mainly poor people. And in the US, you know who those are. They don't look more, mainly like me. And so um, it's, I used to say it's a second worst policy. I'm married to a Native American woman. I'll say it's the third worst policy because our policies in regards to repositioning Native Americans uh, was also uh, imbrued our history. So it's the third worst policy behind slavery and our Native American policies in this country. And it has mm. done irreparable harm to numerous people. Now, you asked a very good question, and I'll, and I'll tell you. I've been very critical of, to, about Mr. Biden. I didn't vote for Mr. Biden. I didn't vote for Mr. Trump. I'm a third-party guy always. Okay. So I have no horse in the race. I'm just looking at his policies. He has been speaking very, very openly, and he's getting a lot of pressure because of Brittany Griner. And Brittany Griner is a very famous WNBA player who yeah. plays in Russia to supplement yeah. her income. Yeah. And she was illegally detained, arrested at the airport in Moscow. At the very same time, amazingly, two weeks ago, Iman Shumpert, who played in the NBA, was arrested, but I'm going to call it illegally detained, since that's what the Biden administration calls it, at an airport, not in Moscow, but in Dallas, Texas. I know. This so, has really shed a light on what's going on in her own backyard, because as much as like we want to bring Brittany Grimer home, uh, again, there's a lot of people saying like this shit's happening everywhere across the U.S. right now, right? A hundred percent. And and let me let me shine a light on two different people. These are people that send me emails. They actually call me from prison for their five minutes, both in maximum security. And and let me put it this way. Everybody who's watching this, that's living in hell, and you could die there, or defending yourself, you get a life sentence if you actually kill somebody or trying to kill, kill somebody because you're a prisoner. You're living in hell every single minute. Two people. One is Parker Coleman. He's, yep. he's in his mid-30s. He has served 11 years, nonviolent cannabis. Now, if you read the nonsense that the DEA put out, it's a press release. It's not in the case file. Nonviolent cannabis. He has uh, 55 years to go. 55. Okay. Let's remember that R. Kelly just got sentenced to 30 years for wow. basically having sex with children. And yeah. so Parker Coleman is living in hell every single day. Why is this then still have, happening, Kyle? Why is this still happening? Well, here's <clears> the thing. <throat> he was sentenced prior to Mr. Biden. But Jose Valero Jr., who I, I shared with you guys before, I was down in Augusta, Georgia, speaking out at his sentencing to the judge saying, you should put me in prison, Your Honor. Me. Because eight pounds is a waste of my time. And what the United States is going to put up there, because I saw her TV screen, she was showing stuff off of social media, which was bowls of this, just bowls of, you know, some eights. I said, 
If you want to see something, ask the United States to not put up anything. Let me just connect with my iPhone, and I'm going to show you what a million square feet of cannabis looks like. I'm going to yeah. knock your socks off because you should be sentencing me, not him. Hmm. So why is it still happening? I would tell you that if I were a congressperson or a senator in this country or the president, who, by the way, the president was involved in the drug war when I was involved in the drug war. I'm the only one saying I was wrong. He, he himself has not come to that realization. I would be embarrassed, absolutely embarrassed. And I'm talking about whether you're on the far left, like AOC or Marjorie Taylor Greene, that's, that's off on the far right. And everyone in between, there is no excuse for this. There is absolutely no excuse for this. Yeah, We're doing yeah. harm to people. And you can't speak out about Brittany Griner, you know, like when, and, and I'll, I'll get off my rant because I do this stuff on Twitter. Yeah. If you want to see my rants, just follow me on Twitter and you'll see. I just I, I can't help myself. But someday you're going to see me sitting down with, with Joe Biden this year. And we're going to be giving him some names, including Parker and including Jose. But the bottom line is you can't say Mr. Putin's evil in regards to this when you yourself have the same laws and you're yeah. sentencing Americans to this. And these are our resources. And this mm -hmm. is our law enforcement, our justice system. Justice is this justice where you have me selling. You can buy my stock. You, you can go in as an American and, and get get a, uh, a Schwab account and buy my shares for less than a less than a cup of coffee right now mm -hmm. and make money off cannabis while your fellow countrymen are trying to survive in hell. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes no sense whatsoever. Out? Makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Now, on that vein, uh, Kyle. About three weeks ago, uh, Weldon Angelos, who we understand you have a relationship with, uh, appeared before the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice and Counterterrorism uh, as part of the COA initiative that was introduced, uh, the COA Act that was introduced uh, that week. Um, so my question is to you is, did you see his testimony? What did you think of it? And also, um, does it uh, represent somewhat of a benchmark that somebody like Weldon Angelos would appear before a subcommittee and give his thoughts about how the prohibition of cannabis has affected him. It, was that a significant moment? So Ben, thank you for asking that question. So I'm proud to call Weldon my friend. And as you can imagine, because I was an advocate to end the war on drugs, I got to know the folks at the Drug Policy Alliance, Marijuana uh, Policy Project, MPP. Um, I would sit with them guys at Oaksterdam University, uh, the advocates, and, and in 2011, we were trying to pass legislation. I'd sit with the LA Times editorial board, La Pignon. So I have some deep relationships where we were all in this. I wasn't getting paid, but I came at it from a law enforcement, we, and we worked together. I asked them, who is the group that I should be working with here where I want, I need to do something. I can't be a chairman of a, and CEO of a company trying to make shareholders wealthy, which would then make me wealthier, while, while my own countrymen are, are rotting away in prison. It would be immoral. So when I shave every morning, I'm staring at this mug. The last thing I want to do is feel like shit because I'm not, I'm not speaking out. And I appreciate the fact that as much as I'm sure a, a lot of our shareholders rather have me trying to get people to look at our stock, I, I really think that it's it's more moral of me to spend this time to say, please call your congressperson and, and, and do something. But Weldon, people kept pointing me to him. And it took us about three months because, you know, I'm looking at him going, OK, he served time. What's his deal? And he's looking at me going, OK, he put people in prison. What's his deal? And we've become friends where, you know, I know his wife, I know his son. Um, and I've Glasshouse Brands, which doesn't have a lot of spare cash, gave twenty five thousand dollars to Mission Green. And I joined his mm -hmm. board. He invited me and I said, I'd be honored to join your board. Um, he is an amazing human being. He was wronged in the war on drugs. He served 13 years maximum security. He was basically sentenced to life for. Wow. They wanted Snoop Dogg and they got and, and they he they wanted other rappers, particularly Snoop. And they used that over his head and he basically fought it and lost and they sentenced him and his his story is something you should you should invite him on your show yeah it's an amazing story and i will not do it justice so i won't tell it further other than to say 
president it was under the bush administration that this happened the obama administration granted him clemency and he was able to gain a pardon from president trump so think about that for a second the the two different sides of the politics from obama to trump and he's has a way of being able to communicate with both sides of the aisle brilliantly well mm -hmm. he speaks he speaks to the senator from utah who's very conservative and Cory Booker invited him to speak in the Senate, as you just mentioned. And Dick Durbin, also on the Democrat side, called him a legend. So one thing wow. he did that, that I took note of, <clears throat> on, a, on, on his cell phone, he was able to FaceTime Charles Koch of the Koch brothers, conservative, with Snoop Dogg. Now, when you think of two people in one sentence, you don't put Snoop Dogg and Charles Koch in it but he gets along great with both. So this is a connector like I haven't seen it. And I'm lucky enough to know it's great, very wealthy people, very successful people, uh, well, you know, uh, celebrities, athletes. I I'm lucky enough that I, 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 I have this weird circle of people I communicate with none better than Weldon Angelos in, in doing this. And he is a humble, not a wealthy man, and instead of trying to go back into rap, he's he's got a lot of people out of prison already, and he is going to be the linchpin because the Biden administration, which right now, like or not, their policies, they've hit their stride. They've actually passed some legislation. Again, whether you like it or not, they've been able to get some things done that they wanted to get done. He promised to, to legalize or, or you know, stop making it illegal and releasing nonviolent cannabis prisoners. He promised it's all over YouTube. And so I believe he will do the right thing. And it's up to us as Americans to hold him accountable. So I believe in President Biden and that he will he will live up to that. And Weldon Angelos, um, he is a special human being and I'm, I'm honored to call him my friend. And it's a weird, we're strange bedfellows but he's he's a, a really br brilliant and, and wonderful human being. Kyle, I'm going to leave this last question. Do you think right now there's enough leaders within the cannabis industry when it comes to social justice are doing enough right now? So I'm not going to judge other people like that, but I will answer it by saying I could really use some help and I'd be willing to um, to the extent that I, I don't really think it's a huge amount of spotlight because my job when I'm with Weldon is to make sure he's front and center because he really is the thought leader when it comes to that. But I have resources, I have a megaphone, and so do, and so do the other uh, folks in the C-suites of, of other companies. And I think that it's a moral imperative for anybody that is trying to make money or is making money in this space and trying to capitalize off a federally illegal business to remind themselves that the laws have not changed. It's only a coal memo, so it's policies. We are violating the same laws that these people are serving hard time. And I mm -hmm. know it's a little scary, and my wife and my parents and my kids, they don't like to hear going, if you're not going to let them out, lock me up. Because you can't have this in our laws. You cannot have a bifurcation or else you were gonna see us, you saw what happened during the whole George Floyd summer where right. you had riots in the street. Yeah. That's what happens when people feel <laughs> like law is not fair. And so I would I would encourage they can reach out to me on Twitter, they can just call Glasshouse. I will happily ask them to work with Mission Green, work with Weldon and and quite frankly <clears throat> do it themselves so that, so that they can start speaking out when they come on your show, on other shows and use their megaphone help put pressure on our leaders to end the war, at least on cannabis. If you don't believe on ending the war on drugs, that's fine. But the war on cannabis, if you're in this business, you need to end the war on cannabis because that's, yeah. that's moral, it's ethical, and you have to hold, it's an uncomfortable conversation to go on a hike because a lot of our folks go on, a lot of the politicians go on hikes with my business partner and I, and Palos Verdes, and that's where we get to know them. And if we agree, we'll make a, a political donation. To but a quick sidebar to... here on that question, Kyle, uh, to piggyback <clears throat> on that, do you think, uh, without judging any individual CEOs, but do you think some 
you know, high level executives maybe think too much about serving the shareholder because that's their primary uh, fiduciary responsibility, right? Do you think they focus too much on that and not enough on the, the issues that you're talking about? You know, Ben, good question. I don't think it's binary. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I keep my, my shareholder uh, fiduciary hat on all the time, all the time. When the decisions that I make for our investments and, and my day to day, uh, in you know, at, I'm at my desk right here, right now, when I'm talking to you, is how am I going to max my shareholder value? Well, ending, ending the war on cannabis does that too. Yeah. But here's the other thing. When the shareholders talk to me and, you know, and by the way, they comment more to me. I get phone calls from my longtime investors when they see me smoking on camera. You know, <laughs> I you love that. Me. You're and, like and, one of the only CEOs who actually does that. Well, and, and here's the other thing. What I've said is, and, and literally it pisses off some of my folks going, do you think you would see Jeff Bezos smoking on camera? I'm like, I said, he's at Amazon. He's not at a cannabis company. <laughs> and the problem is it's easy for our leaders to think that stoners and Cheech and Chong smoke when that's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. I know many professionals that smoke. And, and I would say this, I come from the state where a lot of great leaders came from, including a guy named Harvey Milk. Harvey right. Milk in the 1970s <clears throat> was the first openly gay politician in the United States, in San Francisco. And what did he say? Come out to your friends, because it's easy to vote against gay rights when you think you don't know any gays. But when you realize they're in your family, they're your friends, come out to everybody. And so I tell my friends, I'm like, listen, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a CEO, you're, you know, you make $5 million a year selling real estate smoke on camera, take an edible on camera. You do this, it come out to people. And so then our leaders realize, hey, the same people I'm asking donations from also use cannabis yeah. because more people do, and especially in my state. So I look at it as what I tell them is I'm coming out to the world. Did I look stoned in the, in the Twitter and uh, uh, yeah. And by the way, it started as a long joint. And by the time <laughs> the photo I like, it was, it was, I was pretty high. But I was also, by the way, at home, on my balcony, not going to drive, and I was going to go to bed soon. So I was really enjoying, and the marketing department wanted me to try it. Look, one of my best jobs, today they handed me uh, the Baked Alien Strain. I wish okay. I could give this to you guys. <laughs> it is unbelievable. I'm so happy. And my office is smelling great. And, and the real estate business that I used to focus in on, I didn't get this. And so to me, yeah. it's like, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, but I will tell you <clears throat> so far, none of my investors have come back to me and said, please don't speak out uh, uh, against president Biden. Please don't speak out again. They understand and they don't push me on that. They also know it's my passion. Yeah. They've asked me not to get high on, on camera and I reject it. And I asked them to get high with me on camera. And so far, uh, I've, I'm still a party of one, but I'm inviting you guys if you want to come and I'll smoke with you on camera in a heartbeat. We'll do edibles on camera. We can do tinctures on camera. There's all kinds of, I mean, everyone's going to think this is what I do at my desk, but I, I'm on Zooms all day. So uh, I, you like know, that, that, I love that, it. That's great. That's great. Because one of the big takeaways I had when I was covering the King uh, Cannabis market was that even though we were bringing this market you know, they're opening up these massive greenhouses. No one wanted to admit to actually being a cannabis user. And I always thought that was a little bit unusual, right? Like, because it was almost like they're afraid to stigmatize themselves. And yet they're presenting this business as being normal. You know what I mean? So how can you present normalization when you yourself don't want to admit it just because you're a C-level executive, if that makes sense. So, ben, so I'm glad so, so, that you're opening the window on that. So Ben, let me, let me give you two, two things that I would tell you before people, they want to judge me. And by the way, there's a siren coming. I, I remember I'm here in L.A., so it may, you may hear that in the background. And they're, I don't think they're coming for me yet. Um, so this, this right here is, is very high CBD, low THC, yeah. but yeah. not at a level that, um, that you could sell it anywhere. It has to be sold in dispensaries. It's too much THC. My wife, because we have some family that have been addicted to Oxycontin. When she had her knee replaced, she, she said, I'm not doing Norco, I'm not doing it. Knee replacement, sh surgery. She, and she's in agony like day two. And, and I had this in a vape pen that we were, we were testing. I gave it to her next morning. She goes, oh my God, I got a good night of sleep. 
So she had her other knee replaced. She, we had this. This is all she used. She just had another major medical procedure on Friday. This is all she's using. It's cannabis. Wow. Nobody has ever died of an overdose. To boot, I have a very close relative that is suffering, sadly, from Alzheimer's. What they give Alzheimer's, they basically just knock you on your ass because you can go through some, she, she, she'll go on a 25 minute rant. She will, you know, so what we've been giving her are gummies. This is a woman who has never been high in her life, never drunk in her life, and she now stays high all the time. Now, what I would tell you is she can go on walks with her caregiver. She doesn't get very upset. She can go to church. And once in a while, she has a day where she'll recognize Diane, my wife, and me. It, those are few and far between and getting few. But I will tell you, her, my, my wife's sisters are involved here, too. They did not like cannabis. One of them's a pharmacist. Wow. Now they were like, oh, my God, we need more gummies. Just keep the gummies going. So what I would tell you is cannabis has many uses. So my neighbors yeah. will all of a sudden go, no, 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 I don't smoke. Hey, that's okay. But then they'll go, when I was at Cal in 1980, whatever, I did. But do you have anything for pain and inflammation? And I'm like, yes, I do. Do you have anything for sleep? Yes, I do. And usually it starts that way. And then it comes down to, you know, I really like the way that uh, Cloudberry from Plus, that really worked well. Yeah. Tell me about smoking. Tell me about getting high with a gummy if they don't want to smoke. And it usually, and, and I don't want to say it's a gateway into a gateway because that's been such a terrible, terrible thing. But I'll just tell you, there's so many good uses to this. And I can tell you story after story from cancer patients that even though I was getting high on camera, I need to do a better job of talking about the medicinal uses because they're real. And think about, I just saw something that U.S. doctors in a year prescribed like two billion, uh, no, no. It's like 500 million or no, it was like over a billion prescriptions. Some crazy thing for 330 million. Yeah. So we have become reactive <clears> in this country. <throat> I'm not going to get too far on the rant other than to say keeping this plant illegal is immoral, unethical. Again, not one overdose death. Yeah. Alcohol, which I do support staying legal, is is not a good drug. And I yeah. use I, I enjoy tequila and wine and beer. But I'm just telling you, this, 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 nobody dies, good yeah. uses, and people well, are serving prison time while I'm having a, a nice day. I'm about to go out and have a nice dinner while Parker Coleman and Jose Valero Jr., in our name as Americans, with our tax dollars, are living an utter nightmare. And if it was your family member or was you, you would be begging for other people to call your representatives. So... Do the moral and ethical thing. Write your congressperson. Write your two senators. Reach out to them. Call their offices and tell them to end the war on cannabis and release nonviolent cannabis prisoners. Well said. You know, we also cover the psychedelic industry, and there was a Netflix documentary that came out last month about called How to Change Your Mind, and it really opened up a lot of people's eyes. I almost feel this Brittany Grimer situation has had kind of the same impact in the cannabis landscape. And, um, you know, it's, I hope for her that she gets home safely, but also at the same time too, like this really, really needs to shed light more and more on, um, I, I can't believe that we're still having these conversations and the, some of the stuff that you shared with us, but I really, really appreciate you taking the time here on our podcast today and sharing a lot of this stuff because we've learned a lot. Uh, and most importantly, we have to continue this conversation going. So, uh, uh, let's keep in touch, but I really appreciate the time. Well, Chad, Ben, I, I, as I said, I enjoy just being a viewer. And I know that as, as this industry explodes and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that means your show who's been specializing on this industry, while we are relatively small, we're still a multi-billion dollar industry, um, is only going to get bigger because investors yeah. are going to be looking to you guys to provide insight because you guys are making relationships with people like like Boris and me and, and, and other folks. And so I'm, I'm looking at the same trajectory for you guys and I'm hoping that we, we enjoy this industry. And I really appreciate your guys' time, your focus. And, um, you know, I love coming on your show. So thank you for having me. Awesome. I know that I'll be watching your, your, your next <clears throat> show without me. 
Appreciate it, Kyle. Dust off your passport, uh, Ben. We're uh, heading to California. We got some uh, uh, facilities to see, so uh, that's something I look forward to. Can we do? Can we do a Dale's report from Camarillo from inside a hot house? I would love it. That is a done deal. Yeah. That That'd is be done deal. Both on camera. Would, would you be willing to use on camera with me to show everybody? <laughs> we're we are successful ethical people that actually use cannabis. I'll what throw do you that think? out there as a mystery. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll even yours. throw it out there. I mean, since you take the lead, Kyle, I mean, I'll disclose. I'm more of a, at this point in my life, I'm more of a, a microdoser. Uh, and that's by choice. Uh, when, when I was a little bit younger, it was a little bit uh, more of a, a regular use, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, it. Uh, I, I work, I'm a professional, I go on camera, obviously, and you know, we do a good job and I use it. Uh, I think it's fantastic to keep the focus and to keep uh, energy up. It's almost like a stimulant when you use it in microdose fashion. And that's, that's my chosen use. So if I was on camera, yeah, I'd have no hesitation whatsoever. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I, I hope more people, Shad, I got to ask, or should we just see, leave it? No, as no, no. <laughs> I actually want to ask my viewers that are watching this. What do you think? Should I use, should we be smoking? Should we be doing that in California? Do you want to come and join us? Leave a comment below. Maybe we'll fly you out to California and we'll go hang out with Kyle, but let us know if you think that's what we should be doing on our podcast. Look, There's my I answer. You, I will tell you that even if even if my company said we don't want to spend the money on a taco truck when Ben and Shad <laughs> come out, I'll pay it out of my own pocket <laughs> to have a taco truck come up to Camarillo. You can see the water, you can see the ocean Love at Malibu. It is unbelievable, and we'll have a good time, and we'll use some cannabis together. Nice, nice. We might just move the uh, headquarters out to California after this trip. It sounds like so. <laughs> Anyway, Boris would tell you probably wait a few years on that, but that's Boris. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Indeed, he probably would. Appreciate the time. Let's keep in touch. Thank you, Chad. Thanks, awesome ben. stuff. Thanks, Kyle. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, wait until you see what we have next. Some of the best thought leaders in the verticals that we cover, from cannabis and psychedelics to cryptos and NFTs and sports wagering. So if you want to learn more, make sure to click on that bell for all notifications and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.